Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat number 95, featuring an interview with not one, but two of the greatest game designers of all time, Fred Ford and Paul Ritchie III, the designers of Star Control and many other games that we've covered in previous episodes of this series. It's a great honor, great pleasure to talk to these gentlemen. I know you're going to like this. So without further ado, here is Fred Ford and Paul Ritchie. All right, folks, I'm very excited to be here with two of the great luminaries of the game development world, uh, Paul Ritchie III and Fred Ford. Uh, Paul is known, of course, for uh, several of the games I've covered in previous episodes, Archon, Mail Order Monsters. Uh, he also did World Tour Golf, and the, both of them are responsible for uh, Star Control 1 and 2, and Horde, Pandemonium, Unholy War, 102 Dalmatians, and, and much, much more. So uh, really great to have you guys on. I thought I would uh, start us off uh, just by having you talk a little bit about this uh, top secret project that you've got uh, going on now. It's really fascinating. So what, what can you tell me about that? Um, well, uh, it's Skylander's Spyro's Adventure, and it's an entirely original game that we're creating, uh, and we're focusing on the Wii version of it. But what's really cool about it uh, is that it uses actual physical toys that we've created um, and so as you are playing the game, if you want to be a giant freaky robot, you just grab your giant freaky robot toy and you stick it there on this portal and instantly and kind of magically you become that creature. And so we've got a whole bunch of different toys. The game comes with three, including Spyro. And then as you go through the game, like any traditional good role-playing game, you get stronger and you get more powers. And all of that is recorded in your toy automatically. And you can take the same toy and play in a variety of different either versions of this game or hopefully upcoming games, and your character just sort of gets stronger and more detailed and more customized as you move it around from game experience to game experience. And let's face it, who doesn't want to be a giant freaky robot? <laughs> <laughs> we are toys for Bob, after all. You know, speaking of toys, I want to, you know, we talked a little bit about this uh, last night, but you know, what is the relationship, you think, between toys and games? And uh, you know, how, how closely related are the two? Well, I'll, I'll start. I'll say that um, they sort of play to the same part of your brain or soul or whatever, which is that fun, imaginative play experience. Toys, because they've been sort of isolated from the game experience, really live in the imaginative realm. And they're very tactile. You hold them in your hand, or if you're like me, you bite them and swallow them and have to go to the hospital. And <laughs> so to me, they're very important. And they reflect an experience that I had more as a kid. And then when my kids were growing up, I got to relive biting the heads off toys and going to the hospital. So, but now what we're trying to do is combine the more dramatic vi audiovisual experience and the deeper experience of a game with this sense of a super toy, something that not only comes to life, but it remembers you and your experiences together and its name to kind of uh, combine the two. We're, we're sort of known for hybridizing, you know, whether it's strategy and action or um, you know, skateboarding and crazy downhill racing. And this is sort of a continued living on that hybrid edge now with the toy experience. So we're trying to ruin two industries now. <laughs> dominate, dominate. Oh, dominate, excuse me. <laughs> I think we will totally dominate the toy industry. Once kids see that you can buy this little toy for a, a price that's pretty comparable to any other cool little toy that size, and they see that somewhere there's a game and they can see it appear and give it a name, they're never going to want to have a kind of a dumb toy again, I think. So Hasbro and Mattel, they'll just be furious with us. Now, does this have any similarities to the uh, Webkin's toys? Um, you know, in the sense that they're, you know, you can register them in an online experience. Um, yeah, but we're going way, way past that. Um, and, and I don't want to necessarily get too much into this, because I know people probably want to hear more about the old games. But the... Um, the, the key is that whereas there's this sort of really purely theoretical connection between the toy and then the in-game experience in, in those other titles where you sort of type in this magic code, and then you have this entirely separate electronic experience, ours is constantly referencing back to the toy and you know, putting memories there or getting them out, or you're allowed to switch um, you know, for either personal preference, you know, say enough giant freaky robot, now you want to be scree screaming slime dragon. Um, you can switch anytime you want. 
And so we're trying to say either for strategic reasons or just because you want to be the slimy dragon or you just bought it and you want to see what it looks like. Um, that's, that's one of the big differences is this direct, immediate connection. You know, I'm hearing how much fun. The, the toys sound like they're a lot of fun. The game sounds uh, sound like it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, you're probably the guy to ask this, uh, Paul. I've noticed you've <laughs> you mentioned the importance of fun many times. So uh, what is fun and, and how do you make something fun? Uh, if you ask a million me dollar Fred, question, I'll ask you. <laughs> uh, if you ask me and Fred, you'll get very different answers. I think Fred's got a darker sense of fun. But uh, the, um, you know, I, it's an interesting question. I've been asked before, and I try to give a different answer each time. So one way of looking at it is going through your life and, and all of the times that you're sitting around going, this is not fun, this is not fun. You just check that off, and you create this sort of complex Venn diagram, and anything that isn't horrible uh, it could be considered fun. But really, I think it's, it has to be surprising on one level. I mean, there are enjoyable activities, but that isn't really fun. There's some surprise or new information or um, freshness to the experience. The same thing is hard to be fun time, time and time again. And that's why getting two-player interaction, or sort of like the two-headed transplant right here, um, if you have two players playing a game, then you always get the freshness of, you know, what your friend said to you when you blew up his spaceship or where you punched him this time and stuff like that. So, Fred, you have the dark version of fun. That sounds interesting. <laughs> well, no, I, I would say if it were easy to define, we, but Paul and I would be rich and, and uh, we would probably have a better video connection here. But, uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's something that's elusive and you just have to, you have to iterate over and over to make sure you're getting it right. So I guess it's Although, sort of like a pornography. You know it when you see it, or I guess you, you know it when you play it. But... <laughs> um, uh, no comment. <laughs> All right, well, let's talk a little bit uh, about the, uh, the tabletop days. You know, I know that. I don't know, not sure about you, Fred, but I know that uh, Paul got, apparently got interested in gaming from Dungeons & Dragons and uh, sort of uh, those uh, old role-playing games. Uh, so I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit about those and, and how you got into just not, not just playing, but actually wanting to create your own uh, tabletop games. Sure. I think there's probably a lot of similarity in many ways between Fred and our backgrounds where you know, we had families who were game players and it was a big part of just being social. I have a bunch of relatives who uh, are gainfully employed as cattle ranchers and so playing cards and playing Uno and you know that was just part of the life experience. So uh, then I was uh, growing up in Berkeley uh, half in Berkeley and maybe half on the ranch. And uh, there was a, an art history class, and I was given a choice of writing an essay or making a game on the subject. And I thought, wow, I'll take game. I had no idea what to do, so I made a hybrid uh, bullfighting art history and abstract strategy game all in one. I don't think one game was ever played from beginning to end, but it was called What Did Goya Die Of? And uh, for those of you who know, you'll appreciate the humor on that. And then later on, um, I had been programming up at Lawrence Hall of Science in Berkeley in BASIC, and, and quite poorly. I continued that tradition to this day. And um, I was in high school and went into chemistry class, and there was this kind of dude with glasses, and, and he had these strange fantasy illustrations in front of him on these booklets. And I, I thought, you know, it's sort of like the Napoleon Dynamite moment, where you're like, wow, am I repulsed or attracted to this? And I went with the attracted to it and uh, found out that he played Dungeons and & Dragons, and it was really the very early, early days. He had just gotten the books. And fortunately, his friends, he and his friends, were very creative and thoughtful, and one of them was Errol Otis, who is a, a guy who I've worked with on and off now to this day. And he became one of the original artists at TSR, and I was for fortunate to uh, kind of follow him to TSR as a writer and designer. And uh, we had in high school created some of our own books and published them uh, actually worldwide, made some money, got in trouble with the IRS because we didn't know what we were doing, <laughs> closed down the company and ran away. And, uh, and those books are Booty and the Beast and the Necromicon. And uh, they're for sale on eBay at some ridiculous prices, so rush out right now and we'll sign one for you. But uh, they were a lot of fun and they really led to you know, the career, at least that I have today. You mentioned a friend named um, Errol. Oh, so how did this uh, dynamic work out? He did the art, and you uh, came up with the ideas, or how did this? Uh... 
Oh, uh, well, let's see. How do I be um, charitable to myself? Uh, Errol is a really creative, brilliant, talented dude. He can design, he can write, he can illustrate. And um, so I was fortunate that he did all of the illustrations, much of the writing and a lot of the ideas. So uh, how is this? Uh, this is sounding worse and worse for me. But um, uh, I think, you know, my background is probably more in the writing and, uh, and sort of definition of fiction. That's really what sort of turns me on, at least back then did. And Errol was an extremely visual guy. And so a lot of his stories and, and ideas were associated with images. So we did this book of monsters and we sat, we had actually, there was a third guy, Matt Genzer involved. And we sat around and just said, okay, like, what are these cool monsters and treasures that we could create that are weird enough that they won't sort of overlap necessarily with what TSR or somebody else is doing, but are usable and fun across a broad array of, of um, role-playing games. So like we had this wand of the marrow squid, which has actually shown up in one of Errol's games that would suck your bones out. And I had a couple of characters who got their bones sucked out. And so, you know, we would like write that down and Errol would go off and draw it. And then we'd hand out the writing task to Errol or Matt or myself. And we did that with crazy monsters, crazy treasures, including the first fantasy magical parasite um, group, I believe, which is kind of interesting and disgusting at the same time. And um, then when we went off to TSR, there was so much art for Errol. He really focused on that. And um, he got there uh, in the Deities and Demigods first edition era. And uh, I, the first edition of, oh God, I think it was the DMG. Um, I remember my first job was working on the um, alphabetizing some uh, set of glyphs, uh, which I thought was impossible because they didn't have names. And they gave me the job of alphabetizing these, but I did it. And uh, thereafter, we worked together on the A series of modules and monster cards. Uh, we did some original monsters, uh, as well as a Gamma World module that we did together. I, I have a very soft spot in my heart for Gamma World. I love that game. And uh, I got to work editing with, on Gary Gygax's module, The Legion of Gold. And then also, Errol and I did the mini game that came with the uh, Dungeon Master screen, which was all about being stuck in the Albuquerque airport. I noticed you didn't mention that you're the father of a, of your very own race, a D and D race, the Thrykeen. We, you know, I, I'm pretty sure every serious D and D player has encountered them at some point, right? So, uh, what's how did you uh, come up with them? Well, um, the, that was the the monster cards at TSR, and uh, they, as they often did, they would motivate us with cash prizes. So it's like, hey guys sit down with an artist and together come up with some new monsters. We'll put out these set of monster cards. And so, you know, I'd been, we, Errol and I had created some termite characters in, uh, in Booty and the Beasts. And then I said, well, like mantises are the coolest insects in terms of fighting. So let's, let's create some mantis warriors. And, um, they're, uh, I love the, the weapon in one of the Star Trek episodes called the Klegot. And it was this sort of spinning disc of death. And I thought, well, that's, you know, that's kind of a cool thing to give mantises. They don't really have normal hands. And then I had this whole vision about their history off in the desert. But on the monster card, I got like this much text. So I got to create it. And, and then afterwards, I found out sort of after the fact that they'd taken off in the Dark Sun era. And some people had done some really wonderful, far more extensive designs on it. And, you know, that those kind of mantis creatures sort of start showing up in star control in some of our insectoid races. So that, that's still living in our brains, I think, the, uh, the cool insect warriors and what motivates them and are they going to you know, chop my head off or that kind of thing. I noticed I was reading on Wikipedia, a lot of uh, your different games are on there, and they all have you know, pretty extensive and original stories. You know, so I'm, I'm wondering, what, is the, what do you think is the relationship between a, a story and a game? Because a lot of the early games, of course, I guess the story was mostly in the manual. It wasn't actually in the game. So, you know, what difference does it really make? Um, I'll let Fred answer that one. Uh, well, uh, not all games do you have an opportunity to tell a story. Um, so in Star Control 1 was mostly a tactical strategic hybrid. And um, there was some story there, but it was mostly in the manual, as you say. And in Star Control 2, we made a conscious decision that we really wanted to tell a story. Mm -hmm. um, and 
So we gave we, we specifically made a, an opportunity for ourselves to do that, um, and and for that game it was very important. And up to that point, the games that I think had best done storytelling were the text adventures, which um, I loved and still like a lot. And uh, we just saw that there you need to have time to communicate text uh, in these chunks, you know, and we wanted to figure out what is the right opportunity to do that because if the player is in the middle of blasting someone, he doesn't really want to stop and, you know, read a block of text right then. So uh, a friend of ours, Greg Johnson, had uh, worked on a game, had designed a game called Starflight, and I had worked with him for, I think, three days on it. It was very exciting. Right in the middle of Mail Order Monsters, I got really excited about Starflight and ran off to work with Greg until my producer pulled me back. I love science fiction. But um, what we explored there was the communication system. So when we went into Star Control 2, we, Fred and I were able to think about, well, what are the ways of using storytelling within a conversation between you and an alien? And then there were just these little things that popped up, like um, the statements that are made on the planet surface. And initially, those were really game-driven. And then we just found, well, hey, this is kind of a funny little spot. So you get these reports from these sort of arbitrary unseen heroes like the poor Luigi triplets or the poor um, Lieberman. Lieberman triplets who get blown up on uh, Pluto, I think. And then um, we had this UI built into the Starbase to communicate the things that you're bringing back to be scanned and sort of investigated. And then all of a sudden the lab technicians took on this life of their own and started talking about the things that were happening to them. And so we just sort of found these niches that let us tell a story and filled them in. It seems like those additions really made the game a lot more innovative. I mean, uh, immersive. Well, both, <laughs> yeah. I guess. Innovative and immersive. But. Yeah, they did. But also the fact that we didn't answer every question has really just intrigued people for years to come. It's, um, yeah, that's, we, we worked on the first two games. And then some really nice guys worked on the third game. And I think they were coming into it to a certain extent uh, on the story side, trying to answer a whole bunch of the questions that we'd set up. And I think, looking back now, we would probably advise them, oh, God, don't do that. Come up with new questions <laughs> that are going to intrigue people. That's way more fun and easy and stimulating. So when we've talked about the, the next Star Control game, which, which we promise is, is coming someday soon, uh, it's, it's not so much about going through step by step and saying, okay, what happened to the Anderson? What about this guy? What is Shofixty up to? Um, you know, we would like to touch on some of those threads, but it's also um, how do we bring new characters in here? What's their relationship? Who's moved off stage? And um, it's, it's trying to add more life to it rather than just sort of close it down. Right. I, I know I mentioned uh, Henry Jenkins' Convergence Culture book. You know, that's one of the things he talks about is how if you want to have a connected media, so you have the toys and the games and all this stuff, but each one contributes to, to a story in a different way. So I guess instead of, like, like what you're saying, instead of resolving questions, you know, it actually just uh, you know, makes people more and more curious about more and more things, right? Is that what you're, sort of what you're going for here? Yeah, I think so. I think if you think about the most successful series, whether it's science fiction or fantasy, there, at the very end, there's still quite a bit for you to have filled in with your own imagination. And I think that's the difference maybe between reading and film. You know, there's some people who just don't like to read. But those of us who do, uh, Fred and I are big readers, um, it's, I think we're projecting and, and finishing and fleshing out the experience. And in fact, um, some people around here at work, I will recommend books to them and tell them the story. And then they'll go read them and say, well, that was a good book, Paul. But what about all that part that you talked about that wasn't in the book? And I will have completely forgotten that I've made that all up. <laughs> and so sometimes I've had to say, oh, yeah, well, my, um, my imaginative state and my real world state aren't entirely distinct. So same thing with dreams. I'm always thinking that like bears are actually, I had a whole thing about polar bears were weasel related, not bear related. And isn't that a funny thing? Because everybody thinks they're actual bears. And I went on with this for like years until someone finally called me on it. And I went, oh, I dreamt that. <laughs> the polar weasel. Yep. Yes, it's fun that you mentioned uh, assigning, giving uh, book recommendations to a designer. Because one of the things I wanted to have you do was uh, give us a uh, a reading list 
of uh, science fiction novels and stories for aspiring game designers. And, you know, what, what book would you put on that list? I bet some probably just pop right into your head right away, right? Well, we're big Jack Vance fans. Right. He's an old-time right. science fiction writer, but his work stands up remarkably well even today. Absolutely. His, in the late 40s and 50s, he was writing fiction, like I think on a merchant marine ship somewhere, uh, that would become the basis of the Dungeons & Dragons magic system of memorizing spells and spells having these fancy names. And um, So he was very into setting up rules and, in fact, games in his fiction. And if you read it, you'll almost always find some component of structure which the characters manipulate to their own ends, often nefarious. His characters aren't always good guys. And so Jack Vance would be big for both of us. Um, in terms of dreaming large, games are typically larger than movies and larger than, than novels often in scope. Um, you know, the people who are the space opera writers, so um, I would characterize Larry Niven in there. That's so He might not like that. But um, uh, certainly the... Um, Orson Scott card uh, with the Ender series. Right. Oh, man, I wish you had I'd known this was coming because I would have a big list. <laughs> I mean, um, Dan Simmons' Hyperion series yeah, yeah, Simmons. is awesome in how in the, in the separate stories of the first book, you've got a silent first story. It's almost Cthulian and a love story. And each of them evokes a very different set of emotions, and they all blend together in the, in the second book to sort of finish off that, well, it doesn't really finish off, but to sort of conclude that component of the story. And in a way, that's like a game where you've got all these different parts that are sort of unifying together in the remembered experience. When, when you think back, oh, that's what the game was like, you're sort of combining all of these separate pieces. Um, you know what? Uh, if you have a website associated with this, Fred and I would really love to get back on that because... If you remember, I think it was the first manual, for Star, the manual for Star Control 1, where we did list a whole bunch of people who inspired us. And a lot of new writers have shown up on the scene since then. So it'd be fun to include those guys. Sure, it's a great list. Yeah, it, it, I pity the, the poor people who have not read or, any Orson Scott card, <laughs> you know, especially Ender's Game. I mean, this is, you know, talk about it. That's an interesting book from a video game uh, perspective. Oh, and he's a... A marvelously interesting, interesting dude. Um, I, I think he is. He started out. He wrote one of the first reviews of Archon, actually. Really? Now, a lot of people don't even realize that he wrote all those game reviews, but he was doing that for many years, right? Yeah. Yeah, and then um, he wrote a lot of the insult work with Ron Gilbert for Monkey Island One, and he was working at Lucas on some other stuff. And he came over to a game night that. Um, Greg Johnson, the designer of Starflight, had, had organized. And Greg had this crazy board game he created called Feed the Baby of Love, Mini Beans, or Perish Forever in the Flames of Doom, I think. Something along those lines. And uh, Orson Scott Card desperately tried to figure out the rules and what was going on. And he ended up writing a story called Feed the Baby of Love, of, not really based on that evening, but sort of riffing off that, the idea of going over to a friend's house who's making games. And so that was really fun to get kind of uh, integrated into his work that way. Yeah. Um, it's funny how, so there's books all over my house. My wife uh, reads tons of classic fiction and historical fiction and Russian and French literature. And so our house is very, got neighborhoods. You know, there's my fantasy collection. And then my wife keeps, you know, all of her Virginia Woolf books very far away from them. <laughs> but our house is just completely full of books. And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Should be back next week with more from this interview with Paul Ritchie and Fred Ford. The best is yet to come, and I'm not even halfway through the footage yet, so stay tuned for that. I also want to thank everyone who has been so generously donating to the show. I've been able to keep my drinking horn here filled with some rather choice brew. As a matter of fact, after I'm done here today, I will be enjoying this Hop Hinge IPA, an experimental brew from the Dushute Brewery in Bend, Oregon. Something tells me it's going to be rather excellent. Now, as I want to do, I thought I would leave you with a quotation, this time from Jack Vance, one of their favorite authors. And tell me if you don't think this quotation could apply equally well to a video game. The reader is not supposed to be aware that someone's written the story. 
He's supposed to be completely immersed, submerged in the environment. Jack Vance, ladies and gentlemen, see you next week.